Okay. Okay. So, sorry everyone. Um, my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning um, librarian at UNCG Libraries. We created a series of webinars for the UNCG community on online learning and innovation. This is the 12th webinar for this series, and welcome. Um, so this is recorded, um, and they are performed by different UNCG instructional technology consultants, ITS staff, and faculty on topics of online learning pedagogies, UNCG instructional technology tools, Canvas, Google, Box, et cetera, and more. They're 30-minute webinars, and we put the recordings on this library webpage that I'll put into chat right now. And um, a couple of logistical things about how this will run. Um, I have been muting you guys as you've been coming in. Um, if you have a question, you can either unmute yourself or put it in the chat and I'll unmute you. I'll track the questions in the chat throughout this webinar for Melanie and if there is a you know, pause, she can answer them or we'll answer them at the end. Um, again, please keep yourself muted and if you have questions, just save them. Um, we can have a whole conversation together at the end. So. Um, I put my chat information, I put information there if there's any technical issues, my email address and my phone number. Um, actually, just please email me. I'm working at home today because I had some, um, my daughter has some health issues. But um, we are ready to get started. Sorry, it started a little bit late. But this session is hosted by Melanie Ellie, the online, the um, accessibility coordinator for UNCG Online. And she's going to talk to us today about making images accessible with alternative text. So I'm going to mute myself. And is there any questions before we begin? You can put them in the chat. And Melanie, you can get started. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys again for uh, attending the webinar. And so uh, we'll just talk for a little bit for the next 30 minutes or so about uh, making images accessible with alternative text. So just to give you the goals for the webinar, we're going to just briefly have an overview of WCAG which are the guidelines that are used to um, make sure that online uh, content and web pages are accessible. Uh, then we'll talk about what alternative text actually is. Then we'll move into why it's necessary. And then we'll end with when and how to use alternative text. So WCAG actually stands for, it's an acronym, and it stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And it's basically a set of guidelines that are used to uh, determine accessibility for web pages and online content. And it was first established in 1999, and it has been updated twice since then. Um, in 2008, it was updated, and then it was just recently updated in June of this year. Uh, we refer to the first version as uh, version 1.0, the one from 90, 1999. Uh, 2008 was version 2.0, and then, like I said, the one that was just updated in January is version 2.1. And it's point one because basically uh, 2.0, what was in 2.0 has been left. They added um, a few um, additions to this 2.1, so it wasn't enough to be a full, I guess, move, move up to the, uh, to the uh, 3.0, uh, so it is referred to as version 2.1. So there are three levels of conformance. There's uh, A, single A, double A, and triple A. Single A is basically what you pretty much have to do. It's, it's the basics, the bare minimum uh, for accessibility um, for online content. And then uh, AA is your mid-level. Um, that's what most um, agencies, institutions, those who uh, fall under Section 508, the uh, federal law, um, that's what most institutions are striving, at least looking to, do, to, um, to get to is AA standards. AAA is going to be the top um, most uh, groups, most institutions, organizations are not fully um, a AAA, um, probably are, are pulling bits and pieces from AAA. Um, it would take quite a bit to, um, to have your website or all of your online content a full AAA. So like I said, most are striving for at least AA. 
Um, and Section 508, which is what I mentioned before, that is the uh, federal law that we uh, that we follow. It basically, any institution, any organization that um, receives federal money, um, basically we have to agree to provide uh, persons with disability equal access to our electronic information and data. And it does have to be comparable to the information that those who do not have disabilities have access to. So there are four guiding principles under WCAG, and there is yet another acronym that we use, um, and that's POOR. POOR stands for Perceivable, Operable, Understandable, and Robust. Um, each of these principles have specific criteria that are listed under each one. Not going to go into all of the different ones um, that fall under each principle. With the alternative text, that actually falls under perceivable. And I'm going to show a quick little video here um, just to give you an idea. The four principles are used to group accessibility guidelines. Let's look at perceivable. At the most basic level, users must be able to process the information you present to them using at least one of their sensors. There is no automatic process for this, and so you have to ensure you purposefully make your content perceivable to your users. For example, you need to provide text for those who can't hear audio content, or provide ways for visual content to be heard by people who can't see. If your product or service only works for one of your sensors, then it won't be accessible. The great thing about this principle, as with all of the four principles, is that it benefits a wider group than just those with disabilities. Videos which have subtitles can be watched by people in noisy offices or increasingly without opening videos fully on social media. This principle also covers things like use of colors, color contrast, and using semantic HTML to support users in being able to perceive content in the way they want to. So, that's perceivable. Now, watch the other poor videos. To find out more, visit barclayscorporate.com forward slash accessibility. So that just gives you a quick overview of the perceivable principle. Um, as that video explained, it is looking at your senses. It's, it's appealing to those senses. Um, your audience is going to process the information that you present at the most basic level, um, which will be one of their senses. And so you have to be able to provide your content, uh, present your content in multiple ways. Uh, the video talked about um, visuals, audio, um, your senses, that sort of thing. Um, the alt alternative text falls under that. And so, as I mentioned before, um, alternative text falls under principle one, uh, that first principle, perceivable. The guideline is actually 1.1, .1 and it's titled text alternatives. Um, with un under text alternatives, that covers a wide variety of things, including um, audio and video, um, pre-recorded audio and video, as well as live uh, audio and video. And then it's specifically the success criteria Criterion 1.1.1 is where your alternative text falls. And uh, it's titled Non-Text Content, and it is listed at a level A, which means that um, any time you are using an image um, and presenting that uh, to an audience, it does need to have an appropriate label, um, appropriate alternative text for it. So what is alternative text? It is the text equivalent for an image. Most times it's going to be an invisible description, although um, a lot of times if, you, if you've created a web page, there are ways to actually um, make that when you uh, hover over an image, um, you can actually make that appear. Um, but for the most part, it is invisible, um, and it is read aloud to those who have a screen reader who are using a screen reader. 
Um, it does allow those who are not able to see or have uh, visual impairments, it allows them access to that image. The image is used as a visual example. And your alt text, alternative text, gives meaning to that image. But the meaning should be based on your content and the image's function within the content. And what that means is um, you're not going to always describe your image based on solely the way it looks. Um, and I've got some examples that I'll show you um, a little bit later to fully explain what I mean by that. Um, but the image really needs to be based more on your content and how your image is connected to that content. Um, other names that you will hear for alternative text will be alt text, alt tags. Um, I tend to refer to it as alt text. Um, so you'll probably hear me say that quite a bit uh, throughout this presentation. So alt text is necessary, um, of course, for those who have vision impairment, um, have, have a vision impairment, uh, whether it's partial blindness, complete blindness, um, varying levels of impairment. Um, having that alt text allows them access to that to that picture, to that image, um, and helps them to understand what what you're wanting that picture to convey. But also for websites, alt text helps to uh, improve the search engine optimization. So if you have a website and you have images on that site, if you've um, included alt tags or alt, alt text for those, um, for those images, it will help to rank your page. Um, so like if someone is um, doing a Google search and uh, they're searching for images, um, if your alt text, if you've properly labeled your um, images, your alt text can help to um, push your page further up in the ranking for image search results. So when should alt text be used? It's pretty much any time you're using a picture or an image um, and you're presenting that content, um, when you're presenting content to others. That would include documents, presentations, web pages, emails, forms, um, just about anything that you're using and presenting um, to an audience, um, an online audience, or electronic uh, information. So how to use alt text. Uh, two factors you want to consider as you are putting images um, into your content. The first is you want to uh, determine what type of image it is, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. And then also um, how you defined, you as the author, how are you defining that image's purpose um, for your content. Um, there are some basic uh, tips for using alt text. Um, you, as I mentioned before, you want to describe the image based on the content and the function of that image. Um, you do want to avoid using uh, phrases like or starting it off with picture of, image of, link to. And the reason why is because uh, screen readers and um, assistive technologies that, uh, that have that, that uh, capability of, of reading all text, it's going to announce that um, it will already say image of, um, that sort of thing. So if you put image of in your description, it's going to say it twice. Um, so it's best to just put the text, um, the description, just as you, uh, as you need it to be. Um, you also want to keep your description short and to the point. Um, you don't need to include unnecessary details, um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well. Um, you also don't want to use the file name as the alt text. A lot of times if you don't include alt text uh, for your image, what is listed in the alt text text box is that file name. And that can be very confusing to someone who's using a screen reader to hear that being read as, um, as they get to that image. So instead of them getting a description of the image, they get the file name. So that can be very confusing. Um, as I mentioned before, the author, uh, the person who is creating that content, really determines the image's purpose. Um, and then a question to ask yourself is, would that content, would your content, the message of your content, be changed at all by removing the image? And that 
moves us into the different types of images. Uh, so one type of image is decorative. So going back to that question that I just um, mentioned, if you are asking yourself, you have an image um, and you're asking yourself that question, um, will, I, will my content be changed if I remove my image? Um, it probably will not change the content if it's a, if it's a decorative um, image. Um, and that's because those types of images are pretty much part of your, a lot of times they're part of the layout design. It could be things like a border, uh, decorative bars, embellishments. A lot of times it's what you might use to decorate a page. Um, and a lot of times they are visual design uh, elements on a website. But there are some uh, images that are actual pictures um, and uh, maybe do relate to your um, content, but you may not want to, uh, to label it uh, with alt text because it could be redundant uh, based on the text that you already have in your content about that picture. And so um, that's where it can get a little tricky. Um, I think it's pretty easy to figure out if what you're using is totally decorative and it has absolutely nothing to do with your content. It's just you're putting it there because you want your content to look better. Um, but then if you're looking at an image that possibly could have alt text, but maybe it's redundant, that's maybe where um, some confusion can come in. And so I have an example here. Um, this is an example of uh, where an image could be considered decorative because there's um, adjacent text alternative. So here we have a picture of a sleeping dog, and then the text that is beside that um, picture says the sleeping dog. Let sleeping dogs lie is a proverb that means don't initiate trouble. If something that could be troublesome is quiet, then leave it alone. So this could be considered decorative because that picture is pretty much being described in the text, um, and it's could be considered to be unnecessary uh, to repeat that information. Um, again, this is one of those where it could be subjective as well. Um, you know, you as the author might want to label um, that, that picture. Um, if you do, you wouldn't need anything more than sleeping dog in the, um, in the alternative text. Um, if there's ever a question, if you know, you're not sure, if you think it could be decorative, but you're not certain, um, it's always best to err on the side of caution and, um, and, to, and to add that alt text. But again, you want it to be something very simple. Um, in the case, this is, it is what it is, it's a sleeping dog. And so you could just simply put that and, and be fine. So the next type of um, image is informative. And these would be fairly simple um, images or pictures. They're going to, um, you're typically going to use these to convey a simple concept or a short sentence, in a short sentence or phrase. Um, really don't need them to be any more than 150 characters, including spaces. Um, and it should convey that meaning um, of the content that's being shown. And then it should also reinforce the concept that you've outlined in your text. And so here we have another example. Um, this is an informative uh, image example. And this is where you have a picture that is used to supplement your information. So the information displayed um, is off-duty guide dogs often wear a bell. It, its ring helps the blind owner keep track of the dog's location. So a not so good way to label this would be dog. A better way would be to label it as off-duty guide dog with the bell attached to its collar. Now the second, the good alt text um, option there, it gives a little more detail. Um, the reason why that's better is because the, it's not just a dog based on your content, um, based on the, the content that you have there. The, um, the text is describing the type of dog it is. So it's not, not only is it a dog, it's a, it's a guide dog. 
off-duty guide dog and he has a bell. And so that is supplementing the text that you have there. Here's another example of an informative um, image. This would be where maybe you want to use an image to convey um, an impression or an emotion. Um, again, your pictures um, and your images that you use, they're going to be dependent on how you uh, define the purpose of that image. Um, in this particular case, this is a picture of four children. You could say it's a group of children, but if this is a picture that is on a website and the author is using this because they want to promote their daycare and they want to show that coming to their daycare, um, your children will be very happy and uh, enjoy themselves. So the alt text, the better way to, um, to describe this picture would be to say four happy children at a daycare. That way the person who is using a screen reader, they know the purpose of that image. They know that not only is it a group of children, it's a group of happy children who are at their daycare. Okay, so the next um, type of image is the complex image. And these are going to be images that are going to, they have a lot of information. It's a lot of stuff going on in the picture. Um, typically, it's going to be an image that has a lot of different parts to it. Um, you think of like a map, um, graph, that sort of thing, where it's going to take a lot to um, describe that image. Um, you're going to need more than a short phrase or a sentence to adequately describe what's going on in the image. Again, the author uh, will determine the image's purpose, um, but pretty much for complex images, you're going to need to uh, approach it with a two-part um, alt text approach. Uh, you still want to put a short description in the alt text box, but then you're going to want to also include a long description um, of that, of that image. And here are a few examples. Your graphs, um, diagrams, flowcharts, um, pie charts, maps, anything, like I said, that has a lot of detail. Um, if you are looking at that diagram, um, it's a diagram of a cell, and it has five different uh, parts that have been identified on it. So that's something that um, you're probably not going to be able to fully describe um, in an alt text. Um, will probably take more than 150 characters. And because of that, you would want to then, um, like I said, you have a short description. Again, looking at this diagram, the alt text description could be um, diagram of, and I'm not sure what cell this is, but whatever the name of this cell is, you know, uh, diagram of this cell. Um, but then you'd want to have a fuller explanation um, somewhere else. Typically, the best place to um, put your uh, long description, if you can, you want to put it on the same page. That would be ideal if you're explaining it in the uh, text. That would be great. Um, sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you may need to put it on a separate page. Maybe you need to put it in an, um, in an appendix. Um, or maybe you need to link link it to a separate document, that sort of thing. Um, but you definitely want to make sure that you have it um, displayed. And if it's not on the same page um, as your as your image, then you want to uh, make reference of that in your in your content as to where it can be found. Um, so here I've got three examples, and um, I won't go through all three of them, but I will um, pull up. I'm going to pull up the bar graph example. And this is coming from um, NCAM, which is the National Center for Accessible Media. Um, this is a really great site to use because it has a lot of examples of different types of images and also how you might want to go about describing that image. Um, so here we have a bar chart. Um, there is a caption or a figure here, a uh, figure one description, um, which is what it suggests. You definitely want to put um, some sort of uh, description there of it. But because there is a lot going on here, you will probably need more than um, 
just that long description here, uh, which you see in the figure one. Um, down here at the bottom, it shows a data table. Um, that's extremely helpful for someone who's using a screen reader um, and you're working with charts um, and, and graphs because if it's in a data table, that screen reader, and of course you have to set up your table so that it's um, reading appropriately, um, reading each cell appropriately, but um, anyone, whether it's a person with a screen reader or someone uh, without using a screen reader, they can use this, this uh, data table to further understand what your image is, uh, is conveying up here at the top. Okay. And there are some other examples, and I have also included um, a link in this, uh, my resources page at the end of this document. Like I said, uh, NCAM has tons of different examples of uh, complex images and how you might want to go about um, describing those images. Um, I am going to move over to a uh, work document here. Um, these are a few other examples. I just wanted to quickly show you how um, you may not know how to um, add alt text to an image, so I'm going to show you. It's pretty simple for um, your standard alt text, um, whether you're using Microsoft Office, um, Google Docs, Slides, um, Canvas, WordPress, each of those um, it's a similar process. Um, the quickest way is to click on an image. You click on that image and then you're going to right click and then you go down to edit alt text and then you'll see over here on the right your alt text box will come up and that's where you'll type your, uh, your alt text. So with this image, um, I just wanted to show you I've got a poor example of alt text. Because this um, example is about Abraham Lincoln, the picture is um, showing Abraham Lincoln. And it's basically describing um, who he is, 16th president, where he grew up, where he was born, a little bit about his education. So the poor alt text uh, description says, image of Abraham Lincoln seated, dressed in a suit and bow tie, image is black and white. That's really too much information and unnecessary information because the picture is just basically, the purpose of this picture is to just show a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Um, so the better alt text would be to just use his name, Abraham Lincoln. Um, also, the poor alt text um, used the image of, again, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to say image of, you just put Abraham Lincoln um, as the description. And you want to leave out those irrelevant details and keep it short. So the next example here, um, it, the text talks about um, a website, Fanny Pack's Antics. Um, it's a humorous website that looks at fashion faux pas. Um, and particularly, they've noticed that tourists tend to wear fanny packs when they go to Walt Disney theme parks. So the alt text here, it could be tourist, but a better way to describe that would be fanny pack tourists at Epcot Center. And that's because this picture is really supplementing the information that is uh, listed there in the text. And so that's a, a more concise way to uh, describe that picture. And again, you're going to select it, uh, right click, edit alt text, and then over here in your alt text box you see the description. The last one here is a decorative image. So there's, we've got a bow here um, that was used as decoration on a Christmas party flyer. So this really doesn't need any alt text because it has nothing to do with whatever the, the text is on your on the flyer. It's really just there for decorative purposes. So in this case, instead of, you still would want to uh, select the image, uh, right click, and then click edit alt text. 
And then when your uh, alt text box comes up, normally this mark as decorative is not marked, but when you click on mark as decorative, it's going to uh, basically hide that image from screen readers. That keeps the uh, screen reader from reading that image. It helps to eliminate that as being something that uh, the screen reader user has to, to pay attention to because it's not necessary. Okay, so that is pretty much how, um, a really quick version of how you can um, add your alt text in. And like I said, for, um, for most, um, for most, like I mentioned with Microsoft Office, um, Google Docs, Google Slides, WordPress, Canvas, each of those, um, it can be done in, in the same, same sort of way. Um, I mentioned before uh, with the complex images, I talked about how um, ideally you want to put that um, long description. You do your short description alt text like um, I showed you with the Microsoft Word document, um, but then you'd want to put your long description, your full description of, your, uh, of that uh, complex image ideally on the same page as the um, image, but if not, if you need to use a separate page, maybe put it in the appendix, um, or you could create a separate link um, to, uh, if you are using Canvas or WordPress, you can uh, create a separate link that takes you um, to that extended uh, description of the complex image. Okay, so I've got some resources there. Um, this alt text images decision tree, um, this is from um, w3.org. Um, it goes into extensive detail about uh, the different types of images uh, for alt text. The uh, National Center for Accessible Media, this is the one that I mentioned um, and I showed you an example of. Um, if you go directly to this site, like I said, it has several um, examples of complex images that you can look at and see how, um, like I said, if, if you're looking to see how you might need to um, structure that long description of the complex image, they can give you some examples there. Okay. So do we have any questions? There's my contact information there. Um, feel free to give me um, a call. You can email me um, if you have any questions about alt text. Um, if you have any questions about um, online accessibility, I'd be more than happy to work with you. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Are there any questions from anyone? I know I learned a lot. Is this something we're going to be expected to be implementing in our online classes soon? Um, it is something that that is supposed to be done. Um, when you ask if you're expected to implement it, like if there's a timeline as to when, um, I don't know that that has been discussed um, officially yet. But it is something that uh, that it, that you should be doing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, if anyone has any other questions, they're welcome to put it into chat. Um, remember that all those links that um, Melanie shared, I'll put the PowerPoint and the links um, in the webinar as well in the um, email to you guys with the recording and on that webinar page that I shared on here. Um, and um, I think that, I mean, I don't think we're going to talk about this in detail, but Melanie is working on a website, right, Melanie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so coming soon, and it will have, of course, a lot of these resources on that website. Absolutely, yes. We are actually in the midst of putting it together now. Um, the plan is to have it uh, go live, I believe, in April of, uh, of next year, next semester.
Great. So this, this was the last webinar um, for this semester. Um, you know, I, grades are due next week, right? Or Yeah, this week. I don't know. Soon. Um, but there are um, a new series on the online learning innovation coming up next semester. It's um, on, a couple are already scheduled. We have one on universal design for learning um, with Rob Owens. Uh, that will also have some accessibility stuff in it because um, UDL uh, has a lot of stuff about accessibility. Um, we also have some stuff for more people, I2Cs from UNCG Online, such as graphic design in Canvas and embedding Google Slides in Canvas. So um, two things about how to kind of make usage of Canvas and um, possibly more um, coming up as we are scheduling them. So be on the lookout for um, emails from um, us, the library, or in Campus Weekly, or anything like that, where uh, we'll have the new sign-ups and the schedule. Um, and the schedule will go up pretty soon on that webinar um, webpage that I sent you in the chat. And if you have any suggestions um, about uh, future series, definitely let us know. We're um, always looking for ideas and hosts um, and anything like that. Faculty can host, uh, you know, if you just let me know the idea. So um, that's it. I hope you guys have a great end of the semester. Um, Paige said that she'd like to have more webinars for online course process. Great. Um, and then um, Paige also said that, um, so Paige has a question, Melanie, if you have a second. If we have a student with a disability and the student is taking an online course, how quickly does the course need to be amended if it is not accessible yet? Seems like this would move the course into an urgent level of fixing it to be accessible. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. If you have a student um, in your course and they have a disability that requires uh, some extensive remediation to the course, yeah, it, it has to be done uh, quickly. Um, and that's actually why it is better to, to try to do some of these things prior to that student uh, presenting in your class, coming or registering in your class. Um, because if you do have a blind student or a deaf student um, or a student that just requires some extensive um, uh, accommodations, um, if you've not done any of these things to make your online course accessible, it's very stressful to do it when that student is in your class at that moment um, because it does take time. Um, now that doesn't mean that you have to go through every single one of your courses and follow all of the WCAG guidelines immediately, but I would strongly suggest as you are building courses you think about accessibility and like I said with alternative text, that's one of the simpler um, accessibility issues that you can that you can tackle. Um, so, like I said, if you can do whatever you can do before that student registers in your class is really going to help you in the long run. Great. Um, yeah, and I think I think I said this before, but Paige said um, she would like more webinars on the online course process. Yes, we will continue to provide those. Um, and remember, you know, they are recorded and closed captioned, um, you know, as soon as we possibly can on that web page that we um, sent you. So um, yeah, if there's not if there's nothing else, then I hope everyone has a great um, rest of the week. And um, be on the lookout for the recording coming up, and it will also be posted on this uh, page that I just re-put into chat. Okay, thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.